right. Hey, welcome to the first Sunday of the year. Uh, you can go and open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. I can feel your excitement as we do that. Genesis 17, um, as we turn there this morning, let me just say one, one word about this Foundations for Christian Living class. Um, I can tell you that my, my wife, if my wife were coming up to give an announcement, she's in the nursery this morning, she would tell you that the most impactful class that she ever took in her Christian life was Foundations for Christian Living. Um, it has made an immense difference in the way that we have looked at the world, the way we've looked at ourselves, the way we have parented, the way we have, um, we see our own personal sin, our understanding of, of various issues like uh, marriage and divorce and, uh, and anxiety and depression, and all of that is covered in this book, um, in this time together. So listen, if you are wondering what would be a class that would be impactful for my Christian life and be one class, I would tell you that would be the one to take, right? Foundations Christian Living, it's, third, it's the third Thursday of, of every month. They'll be from six to eight, I believe, is the time. Bill Hurd's the teacher. Bill was our teacher when we went through it. And I can just tell you, 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 will, be, you will be in God's word, learning how to apply God's word in a way that, is, it, that gives you principles for the Christian life that are remarkably important. All right, so that plug, let that be for you. I, you. If you're weighing what to do this year, that would be a class I'd tell you to jump into, okay? Genesis chapter 17, where we're going to be this morning, um, and I can feel your excitement, right? I mean, after seven months, right, we are back in Genesis. If you're new with us, uh, you might have come in after May, and you have never known we have been in the book of Genesis. Uh, our last study in the book of Genesis was the last Sunday of May, of last year. We started in January of 2023, and now we're jumping back into Genesis 17. And, and the book of Genesis is a book that really takes us back to the beginning of time to begin to answer some really important questions. You know, how did God set the world up? Why did God set the world up the way he did? What, what does God have to say about the issues of our day, right? I mean, I, I always get amazed by our culture and our media asking how individual people might think about things, but they always leave one person out about asking his opinion, and that's God's. What does God have to say about gender ideology? What does God have to say about sexual ethics? What does God have to say about how we as humans relate to God? Well, the book of Genesis answers these things. It speaks to him. It, it talks to him. And, and it tells us that, that God set everything up for a couple main reasons. One, he set things up to glorify him and bring him great joy and pleasure. But another reason he set things up is to maximize human flourishing. God made things in such a way to maximize our joy and pleasure while living on planet Earth. But as we saw in the opening chapters of Genesis, rather than living and, and thriving in our humanity, we rebelled against God and decided that our way was better than God's. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, sin entered the world, and with it came death, hard and burdensome, wearying labor, relational family and international conflicts, and evil and great immorality everywhere. And even though we rebelled, in Genesis 3, God promised to send a champion to save us from our sin and our misery, to conquer our adversary, the devil. And throughout the early stages of the book of Genesis, we read about God's deliverance of Noah's family from this flood of judgment and the hope that this champion would come out of Noah's family to conquer and cure all of our ills. But soon after coming out of the ark, Noah and his family failed. They sinned against God. Even though God in his mercy and grace kept pursuing humanity and we tried to build a tower to heaven to be like God, in our, in our rebellion against God, God decided, hey, we're not going to have that. And God thwarted that plan of our, of our superiority and our pride by confusing languages and sending people all over the earth. And as they went to all over the earth, guess what they took with them? Their sin. Humanity's rebellion against God 
went throughout the whole world. And the search for this champion and how God and how humanity can be made right with God continued. In Genesis 12, we were brought to a man named Abram. Out of nowhere, even though Abram was the son of an idol worshiper, God promised to bless him beyond measure. Abram did nothing to deserve this, but God's mercy and grace were dispensed on him. In Genesis 12, God begins to narrow the focus of where this champion is going to come from to a particular people, a nation, a a people for his own possession. We need this champion. You know we need this champion. Because ever since Genesis 3, all has been lost. We have lost our way as humans. We we have conflicts in our hearts and in our homes and in our in our world. We we've lost our way as men and women. I mean, the idea that we're confused about our genders, we're floundering in the purpose of our work and our identity as image bearers has been has been tainted by our sin. We have no idea how to return to the, to the days of the Garden of Eden where human flourishing were at its highest. And really the biggest question that the book of Genesis is, is answering, it's really loudly proclaiming, is this question, how does God make humanity right with him once again and restore humanity to a place where we can glorify him and we can thrive in our humanity again? That's really what the book of Genesis is is answering. And thus far in our study of Genesis, we've seen two main things in Genesis. You know what we've seen? We've seen that we as humans keep blowing it. And we see that God, the God of heaven, keeps pursuing us. And that's what I hope we're going to learn today in Genesis 17. This is the big idea for today. And then we're going to read the text God's relationship with his people comes through his mercy and grace. And our response to him is wholehearted devotion and obedience. God's relationship with his people comes through his mercy and grace. Our response to him is wholehearted devotion and obedience. Now, you know this in your own lives. How many of you were pursuing God when God came after you. I know where I was. I was running on my own path. I had no desire for God. Yet God in his mercy, God in his grace, revealed the glorious truth of the gospel of Christ to make Jesus' saving grace so overwhelming that I had to believe in him. That's what we're going to see this morning. God pursuing people through a covenant of grace. Let me forewarn you, we're going to jump into a text about a funny little phrase called circumcision. It's a word. And you go, wow, dude, you picked the first Sunday to get back into Genesis and you picked circumcision, right? <clears throat> Just tells you how bold I am, right? Or how stupid I am, right? But as you know here, one of the things that we love about preaching here is we believe in the expositional preaching of God's word. And here's what the preaching of God's word this way does. You can't ignore things that are in the Bible. But the other thing it does to us, it reveals to us that every page of scripture is given to us by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that we can be adequate and equipped for every good work. And that means Genesis 17, a story about circumcision, is going to reveal something to us. Now, it's going to require something of us. We've got to be mature, right? So you can't be a junior high boy giggling and laughing all the time, right? It's going to require something of us. It's going to require us to look at these things in a deep way. Now, let me just forewarn you as well. We're not going to cover all the depths that go into the covenant of grace that's revealed here, but we are going to reveal some things about this covenant that I think will stir our hearts to worship the God that we serve. So let's stand together. We're going to read the entire chapter. If you can't stand for that long, feel free to sit down. It's okay. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. This is the reading of God's word, and this is God's word. 
When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called, shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout your generations, their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abram, as for you, you shall keep my covenant and you and your offspring after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or, or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not from your, of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abram, Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 99 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, shall your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house and bought with his money every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house were born in the house, and those bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. This is the reading of God's word. May he bless the preaching of his word. Amen. You can sit down. Thank you. Now, listen, if you're new with us or you had a friend come with you or you brought your friend, don't panic, all right? I mean, have you ever brought a friend to church and then things get weird, right? I mean, okay, things are not going to get weird, so don't worry about that. Um, Rachel, put the big idea back up real quick. Here's, here's what we want to learn today, okay? God's relationship with his people comes through mercy and grace. And our response to him is wholehearted devotion and obedience. So let's look at our first point in the outline, which is the covenant. You're going to see this in verses 1 through 8 and verses 15 through 21. In verses 1 and 2, you'll notice God Almighty, El Shaddai, came to Abraham, Abram, to make a covenant with him. Now, as we've noted briefly in our in previous in our study of Genesis, a covenant 
is an unchangeable agreement between God and humans that lays out the rules or the guidelines of our relationship with God. It's an unchangeable agreement between God and humans that lays out the rules or guidelines of our relationship with him. It is God-given, it is God-directed, and it is something that only God can fully, perfectly accomplish. The book of Genesis, we've already seen a covenant given to us before, and we're also seeing in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, a progressive nature of the Abrahamic covenant that's been given to us. We've already noted in Genesis chapter 12 where God promised to make Abram a great nation, make his name great, and from him all the families of the earth would be blessed. But God returned to Abram a few years later in Genesis 15 and gave him more details of this covenant. Knowing that God had promised him a family, childless Abram was perplexed. How would God bring about the promise of a family and nations coming from him without a son? And in Genesis 15, God promised to provide for him his very own son as an heir. Not not a servant that he had in his house, but his very own physical son. And then God said that his family would outnumber the stars. And then after years of waiting for this promise to be fulfilled, Abram and his his wife, Sarai, begin to impatiently wonder, we have no son, we're not getting any younger, how is this going to happen? And in Genesis 16, Sarai plots out an incredible, weird, odd plan. Why don't you take my servant Hagar and have a baby with her? Of which Abram says, okay. And Genesis 16 finishes with this verse. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So from the end of Genesis 16 to the beginning of Genesis 17, there's a 13-year gap. So just think about that for a moment and wonder how impatient would you get with God? We can't last 13 seconds, much less 13 years. So 13 years later, El Shaddai, the God of the universe, comes to restate his covenant to Abram once again and give him some more specifics about this covenant. Notice what they are in the text. He said to Abram, You'll be the father of a multitude of nations, and kings shall come from you. That is, generations and the family heritage after him will benefit from this everlasting covenant. The land of Canaan, the promised land, would be theirs. Each time God visited Abram in chapters 12, 15, and 17, he gives him a progression of things to happen. Now, this is a lot like our own lives, right? You, you may look at your own life and think, man, the things I know now for me as a 53-year-old man, I know much more now than I knew as a 35-year-old man. That's what you're seeing played out in progressive revelation that God is progressively giving his, his covenant to Abram. It's the same covenant, just giving it to him over time. Every time God approached Abram, It was God pursuing and making a covenant with Abram. Don't miss that. The God of heaven descends to come after Abram. And every time he's coming to make a covenant with him, God Almighty, the one who says in the text, this is my covenant and I will make my covenant with you. In other words, we don't cut deals with God. God cuts covenants with us of his own choosing, of his own timing, and of his own rules. Now, God does this because he is merciful and gracious, not because we're worthy of him pursuing us. This covenant with Abram is called a covenant of grace because God made this covenant even though Abram was a son of a pagan, an idol worshiper. And even though Abram had failed God many times, this is God's covenant done by God's power 
because of God's grace. And you can see several evidences in the text, but let me just point to you of two of them. Notice first the name changes from Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. Both names mean something. Abram means exalted father, but Abraham means father of a multitude, which fits more in line with how God identifies Abraham. Sarai means my princess in a very narrow, uh, personal way, but Sarah means princess of the whole. In other words, showing that God identifies her as the queen mother of Abraham's family, which, which is to include multitudes, not just one. Now, this significance cannot be understated. God identified them with name changes, which in essence is changing their status, changing even who they saw themselves to be. I mean, Sarah saw herself as the mother of Isaac, not the mother of multitudes. Abraham saw himself as one little guy that God just happened to bless with the idea, you're going to be the father of many. That's one thing. Notice the name changes. But secondly, notice, notice God's power and grace evident in Isaac being the son of promise. Now, Abraham and Sarah in this text, and actually when God gave them the promise, were way past childbearing years. This is why Abraham, you notice in the text, he, he fell on his face when God told him that Sarah's going to have a baby, name him Isaac, and he, he snickered under his breath like, wow, how's that going to happen? But it's also why Abraham offered Ishmael as the son of promise. See, in Abraham's mind, and you've got to grasp this, he already had a son. And Ishmael is good enough to move forward with to have this promise fulfilled. But that's not what God had in mind. Now, here's why. And you need to listen to this very carefully. Ishmael was conceived by Sarai's ingenuity and her wisdom. But it was not the plan of God. Isaac's conception would be by the power of God alone. In other words, human ingenuity, human wisdom, human power alone has no power to bring about the son of promise. Only God can do that. That's the point. Don't miss that point. Human ingenuity and performance cannot ever make us right with God. Only only grace given to us by the power of God can do that. Now we're going to see later in the Bible this same covenant of grace fulfilled in Jesus Christ, God's ultimate champion, who lived perfectly in our place, died in our place, the death that we deserve, rose again from the dead. This was God's doing. We are not made right before God by our intellect, our hard work, our wisdom, or our good deeds. God is not interested in your performance. You know why? It stinks. God's grace alone is what makes us right with him. And when we believe in God's grace alone, found in Jesus alone, guess what God does? He literally changes us. He changes our entire identity, much like he changed the names of Abram and Sarai. Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 5 when he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. <clears throat> God's grace alone makes us right with God. God's grace alone changes our identity. It changes our status. We're no longer enemies of God, but children of God, beloved children of God, with grace and mercy bestowed to us. Grace is God's way of making us new and returning to the Garden of Eden. The covenant with Abram reveals this to us. 
And we're going to need that grace as we look at the sign of the covenant. Now, before we get there, I want to ask you a question when you think about this glorious grace. Maybe this week you've been battling condemnation, you've been battling fear because you think to yourself, you haven't performed very well. And the wonder of the covenant of grace is that your God, before you were ever born, already knew that. And he, didn't, he sent a Savior because he knew you were going to blow it. And so this morning, rather than looking at grace as something far out there, look at grace as something that has come to you now. Now we need this grace as we look at the sign of the covenant, which we're going to see in verses 9 through 14. We're going to now deal with the elephant in the room. Circumcision. I told my wife when I was going over this, I said, should I just have everybody repeat after me? Circumcision, right? Because that's what we do in our family devotions, right? Circumcision. Everybody say after me, circumcision. And my kids go, dad, don't do that, right? So everybody relax. We're not going to do that, all right? <clears throat> now, we have seen a sign before of the covenant. Happens every time it rains. It was given by God to Noah. The rainbow. A sign that God would never destroy the earth again. And now we have the covenant of circumcision given to Abraham and his people. Circumcision is simply cutting off the foreskin. And God told this Abraham this was to be done to every male in his family line. They were to be circumcised on the eighth day. And circumcision was a sign between God and Abraham's people, the Jewish people. But you're going to notice in the text something interesting that Abraham and God makes a way for non-Jewish people who join their community for their males also to be circumcised because if they bought someone, they became part of the community of faith, he commanded this to be done to them as well. Now listen, in our culture, we don't talk about these kind of things openly and they're awkward and they seem weird and we don't really wrestle through these things, but in their culture, this was a normal thing. One way you can evidence this is you're going to notice how many times the word circumcised is used in the text. It's used nine times in about 10 verses. It's like God saying circumcision, circumcision, it's over and over. And you're just like, okay, I get it. Can you not use the word foreskin again? But he just keeps bringing it home. Why? It was something that was widely practiced in this day and age, in this culture. There were nations around that actually practiced circumcision, but others did not. You know, nations like the Egyptians and the Philistines ridiculed the Jewish people for being circumcised. It's part of their joke and their stuff for the day. Now, the question you might ask is, why is this sign given as this part of the covenant? Well, understanding some of the reasons helps us kind of grasp why it is. So here are some reasons that I think will help us. The first is... Where this sign lands in the context of Genesis, we can't ignore this. This is something I was talking with Luis Castellanos a few days ago as I was wrestling through the why of circumcision. And you'll notice something fascinating in this text, where it's landed. In Genesis 16, you have Abram taking Hagar and having a baby with her. And then you're going to notice in Genesis 18 we're going to get into the immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah. And right in the middle, you've got Genesis 17, the sign of, a, of circumcision. Circumcision seems to be a sign from God saying to his people, listen very clearly, human ingenuity, wisdom and power alone do not bring about God's promises, Hagar and Ishmael. And unfaithfulness to the covenant will not be tolerated, Sodom and Gomorrah. And right in the middle, what do you have? A sign of what God wants his people to look like and act like. Alan Ross wrote this, the rite of circumcision was appropriate to the nature of the covenant. With this symbol, God instructed his people regarding the joining of faith with the act of reproduction. The sign was sexual. The promise was for a seed, the covenanters would be reminded, one, 
that human nature alone was unable to generate the promised seed if God was not willing to grant such fruitfulness, and two, that impurity must be laid aside, especially in marriage. So one reason for the sign is it reminds us and reminded these people, listen, human ingenuity and human nature alone will not bring about God's promises and violations of this covenant will not be tolerated. You'll see that at the end when God says to Abraham, if, if guys aren't, people aren't circumcised, they're cut off from the people of God. Won't be tolerated. But secondly, you'll notice that I... That circumcision was, was an identity marker for the Jews and a way to keep their family line pure. The early church father Chrysostom wrote this, see the Lord's wisdom in knowing how inobservant future generations are likely to be. And so, as though putting a bit in their mouths, he gave them a, the sign of circumcision. Curbing their unrestrained urges in case they should mingle with other people's. You see, he was aware of their lustful tendencies and not practicing restraint, even though it had been drummed into them countless times to refrain from their irrational impulses. Consequently, he gave them a perpetual reminder with this sign of circumcision as though fastening them with a chain. He set limits and rules to prevent them overstepping the mark instead of staying within their own people and having no association with those other peoples, but rather keeping the patriarch's line uncontaminated. The Jewish people throughout their history were commanded by God not to intermingle and mix and marry people from other non-Jewish nations. And this sign of circumcision was to be, in a sense, a barrier for that, reminding Jewish men, you can't go there. And this is why circumcision was only for men. It was to protect the family line of the Jewish people. Third reason, and I think this is an interesting one, something that I think puts circumcision in a very unique light, and this is the light we're going to draw mo most of our, our thoughts from, is this. This is really about wholehearted devotion to the Lord. I mean, think about this for a moment. The private regions of our body are our most sacred and protected parts of our bodies. That's the reason why we don't reveal our nakedness outside of the covenant of marriage. It's to be protected. There are some things that are to be protected, and this is one of them. Circumcision done to a male's sex organ is a sign of giving oneself wholeheartedly to God because of some reasons. James Smith gives us, I think, the most compelling one when he wrote this. Far from being disreputable, this was the most sacred part of his body. Thus, if this, the most private of body parts, was dedicated to God, so must his whole person be. See, far from a flippant commitment or just a weird thing that the community of God did, this was about devotion to the living God with their whole being. This was about giving up their lives for his. This was about identifying as a child of God, submitting their whole person to God. Now, the obvious question then from this would be, okay, well then, preacher, do we still practice this today? Is this still a religious right that we as Christians are to do today? And the answer is no. And here's why. The main reason is, and the big reason is, because Jesus has come. And Jesus has brought a greater circumcision than a physical one. He's brought about what the Bible calls the circumcision of the heart. Paul wrote about this in two main places. In Romans chapter 2, Paul wrote, For no one is a Jew who is one, merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. See what he's doing? He's removing the sign. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. But then he wrote in Colossians chapter 2 something else. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, meaning the spiritual sinful flesh, by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, revealing to us a new 
sign of the new fulfilled covenant in which you are also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your sinful flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. See, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection brought about a greater circumcision, one of the heart. And this brought about a greater sign, baptism, which reveals our union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. The early church father, Ambrose, wrote this. For this reason, it is not inappropriate for us to understand that bodily circumcision is a sign of spiritual circumcision. Therefore, the sign remained until the truth arrived. The Lord Jesus arrived, who said, I am the way the truth, and the life, because he circumcises the whole person in truth, not a minor bodily member in sign. He abolished the sign. He installed the truth, because once that which was perfect arrived, that which was partial was abolished. Thus, the circumcision of a part ceased when the circumcision of the whole shone forth. For it is no longer man in part, but whole man who is saved in body, saved in soul. Are you hearing wholehearted devotion? For it is written, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is the perfect circumcision, because through the sacrifice of the body, the soul is redeemed, of which the Lord Jesus himself said, whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. So you see, this is about wholehearted devotion. Whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. Those who belong to Jesus give up their lives for his. We are identifying as his followers. Therefore, there's no need for physical circumcision any longer for spiritual reasons because Christ has come and cut away the flesh of our hearts and made us his own. And you can see in the text how immediate Abraham responds to this. Let's look at our last point, which is the response. Because here's what I want to ask you as we're looking at this. When you hear wholehearted devotion and obedience, is that where you're at in light of grace? You're going to see the response of the covenant in verses 22 through 27. Notice that after God left Abraham, he immediately obeyed. Notice the text gives us two times it says it. That very day. What's interesting about Abraham, if you do a study of his life, is you'll find that every time God showed up and spoke something to him, he worshiped. He obeyed, he believed. In Genesis 12, the Lord called him to leave his homeland and travel <clears throat> to a land the Lord would show him. He went immediately. In that chapter, God showed him the land, and when he got to the land, he worshiped. In Genesis 15, the Lord told him he would have an heir. The Bible says in Abram, believe God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And now in Genesis 17, we see the same thing. Even at the beginning of the chapter, when God first showed up, he fell on his face and he worshiped. Every moment that God spoke, Abraham worshiped and obeyed. This is why Abraham is the father of our faith. He's the first guy you notice in the, in the Bible, God speaks, he acts. God speaks, he believes. God speaks, he worships. You know why? Because this is what the covenant of grace does to you. The covenant of grace is God out of nowhere calling the son of an idol worshiper to follow him and make him a father of nations. The covenant of grace says, childless Abraham, old man Abraham, you and your wife are going to have a baby. 
And that baby is going to be the son of promise. And I'm going to show you great and glorious things. And all Abraham can do is say, who am I? This is all an act of God's grace. But friends, what God's grace to you does to you is it changes you. It transforms you. It empowers you to worship and obey the living God because you cannot believe that you, a sinner, the the most filthy one in the room, that the God of the universe would send his son to die for you. You, That would, this blows your mind that he would make a covenant with you. And we know why Abraham's obedience is important. The book of James tells us this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's just by faith, man. This is the, God's word. Was not our father Abraham justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Which we're going to study later. You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. What is James talking about here? What he's saying is that Abraham's faith in God's promises made him right with God. God's grace alone made him right with God. But Abraham's obedience revealed the hidden nature of faith. It made faith visible and real, and that his obedience revealed that he had faith in God's promises and that God's grace was alive in him. There's an old adage that you should never forget. Faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. This is kind of like going to Costco, right? I mean, you guys go to Costco, right? Don't you? Some of you do, right? Probably going there after, you know, after church. You got to buy yourself an eighty-dollar hot dog, you know. <clears throat> so you go to Costco. You got your basket of groceries all ready to go. You wheel yourself into Costco, into the into the cashier's line, and as they're doing the whole checkout thing, they suddenly look at you and say, "Hey, uh, everything's been paid for. Somebody else took care of it. That's grace, especially with a family my size, right? That's grace, okay." Then they give you the receipt. You take the receipt. By faith, you take the receipt. It's been paid for. And you know what you got to do at Costco, right? You got to go to the exit door. And before you get out the door, you got to show obedience. Here's the receipt. And the dude goes and takes that little green marker and just goes, I don't know, he doesn't look at anything. He's just like, okay, great. And you're out the door, right? That, that's how this is like. Grace is someone else paying. Faith is you believing it enough to take the receipt and start walking to the door. Obedience takes the receipt and says, see, paid for. Nobody can know your groceries are paid for unless you show the receipt at the door. Nobody knows that you believe unless you obey. Obedience is showing the receipt that the bill has been paid Abraham's response to God's covenant shows us the way we should respond to grace with wholehearted devotion and obedience. That doesn't mean perfection, but there's a leaning in. There's a desire to change, putting off of sin, wanting to be different, wanting to maintain a pure and holy life before a pure and holy God because grace is so amazing. See, the covenant God made with Abraham was God's and God's alone. It was an act of God's mercy and grace. God pursues sinful, wayward, wandering people. Why? That's what God does. See, you may be here today going, dude, I came to church today and I don't know if I'm right with God or not and I don't know if I should be here because I'm not right with God. And I'd say, no, you're in the right place because the God of the universe is saying to you, I'm after you. I'm coming after you because that's what this God does. He shows that with Abraham. God didn't pursue Abraham because Abraham obeyed. He didn't pursue Abraham because he's from a great family line or he had great success in his past. 
He didn't pursue Abraham because Abraham had anything to offer God. He pursued Abraham because God is merciful and gracious. That's why he pursued him. And guess what? He does the same to us. And he's already done the same to us. Because he has sent to us one who is greater than Abraham. Before Abraham ever breathed one breath out of his mouth, the Son of God eternally existed with the Father. And in the fullness of time, the great I Am, Jesus, became like us to obey God for us, to fulfill every demand that God has on us, and he came to give his life for us. He came as a ransom for us. On our behalf, he came to fulfill and finish the covenant of grace. And this text, pointing us to Jesus, is declaring and asking, what is your response to him? Is it wholehearted devotion or half-hearted apathy? Is it worship or a yawn? Instant obedience or persistent rebellion? Now what's crazy is Abraham actually addresses the danger in the text of not obeying and presuming upon God's grace. A lot of Christians do this in our culture today. They raise their hand at vacation Bible school when they were seven, got their name written on a card or something, told somebody they believe in Jesus, And then go through a life of sin after sin after sin after sin after sin after sin after sin sin and still say, I'm a child of God. Abraham, God would have something to say about that. Paul would at least tell you, you better be examining yourself to see if you're in the faith. If there is persistent, consistent, habitual sin that you and your arrogance continue to say to God, no, don't touch that. You need to evaluate if you're really a child of God. The issue is not a profession of faith. The issue is a possession of faith. And the possession of faith begins to change you because listen, here's what happens to a child of God. Grace changes you. Grace changes motivates you. Grace inspires you. Grace pulls you along to obey. Even in moments you go, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. Grace becomes so overwhelmingly amazing that you can't help but worship and obey. You cannot help but say, God, please forgive me when you know you've blown it. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it and we'll never do anything to gain it. And listen, if we're left to our own devices apart from God's grace, you know what we're going to do? We're going to run straight to hell thinking hell is good for us. But God's grace never stops. Friend, listen, God's grace never stops. His mercies are new every morning. His mercy is new to you today by getting you in the building so you could hear a message that God is coming after you. He loves you so much he sent his son for you, for rebels like us. That his everlasting love would never cease toward you. He has loved you because he set his heart to love you. Not because you have anything to offer him. You see why? If you're not wholeheartedly devoted. That just means you're leaning in. And there's not some obedience coming out of you. And there's persistent sin. You You need to repent. And what that means is, Just run to your heavenly father and return to him. So listen, God, I want to do it your way. I believe in Christ. I want to change. Now listen, you you should have seen through this the big idea. God's relationship with his people comes through his mercy and grace. Our response to him is wholehearted devotion and obedience. Now, this is a fantastic lead-in to the Lord's Supper. It's a fantastic lead-in that we're going to take together. Because this moment, don't let this moment pass you by. The worship team's going to come up. Don't freak out. People are moving. 
It's one of the ordinances that just gives us time to pause and reflect of God's grace toward us and our response to him. See, we take the cup and the bread, looking back on what Jesus has done for us. We take the cup and the bread, looking ahead to what he's going to do and coming for us. We take the cup and the bread, thanking him for his present work in us. And we take the cup and the bread as a moment of evaluation. Don't just take these elements and just toss them into your mouth. No, take the elements as they're getting ready Examine yourself. If you are not in the faith, two things. One, come in the faith. Man, believe in Christ. Turn to him. Or if you're not going to, it's okay to let the elements pass you by and just not take them. If you are a child of God, take the elements and let the Lord reveal to you where in your heart Are you not responding with worship and obedience to the covenant of grace? It's a moment just to take these things in together. Listen, let let this moment be, we're amazed at God's grace toward us. This is not a ritual. This is a moment where we pause, reflect, evaluate. So let's pray, and I'm going to have the guys serve us our elements. Oh, Father, we stop to say thank you for pursuing us. Church, tell him thank you. We are humbled that though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were yet sinners, Christ, Christ died for us. What amazing grace. And you, the God of heaven, would graciously and mercifully and kindly keep coming after us. And Lord, I pray this morning for those that are listening or who are with us today that don't know Jesus. I pray that you would bring them to repentance. So if that's you right now and you want to trust Jesus, then take a moment before God And just tell him, Lord, I believe in you. I believe that Jesus came for me. Forgive me of my sin and make me yours. I want to serve you. Father, do your work in our friends who have come, who are listening. A work that only you can do. I pray for the Christian, the so-called Christian, who has lived in a variety of willful sins and they continue to do them knowing that they're sinful against you. And Lord, today, you want want it to stop in their lives. And I pray right now that you would help them, give them the grace to repent and change and turn to you for empowering grace to change. If that's you this morning, then right now, name your sin before your God. It could be ongoing, uncontrolled anger. It could be unbridled immorality. It could be that you're living in a relationship that you know does not honor God. And this morning, your God's grace is greater and more loving than that thing you're pursuing. And you know this morning... You just need to turn to your God. Just do it this morning. He is faithful and he is just to forgive you as you turn your heart and your life to him. And the Father, we we as your people turn and we, we just say, Lord, open us up and reveal to us the areas where there is the wholehearted devotion is lacking and the obedience is frail. Forgive us for making excuses and presuming upon your grace. Forgive us, Lord, for stalling our obedience under the name of procrastination. Forgive us for misappropriating and misunderstanding the covenant of grace. 
And if that's you this morning, you have a Father in heaven who has sent his Son for you. And he's calling you to himself to confess your sin and believe him for empowerment. He will help you. And Father, as we take these elements this morning, we take them in faith. We take them with joy, with, with soberness, knowing that we are identifying with you as we take them into our body, that we are yours, you are ours, and we're taking them to say, Lord, we, we want to obey, we want to worship, we want to be devoted to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.